Thank you so much, Benny, and thank you so much, Ms. Festival, for, for that warm and, and, and introduction. Yes, I really appreciate it. Uh, because I also work in communications, and because sometimes and increasingly I find myself personally struggling with the jargon that we use a lot in the feminist and activist world, I try to simplify things to myself. And so, in the earlier um, conversation, I really appreciated what Ati said about if we think of colonization as, you know, a moment of fracture, right? How is that still affecting us today? And I thought that was a good way for me of understanding what does it mean when we're talking about post-colonial, right? And for myself, I also translate this topic for this particular panel discussion as what are the challenges that African feminists face today? And I don't think you can talk about African feminism without talking about LGBTQI activism. To me, it's synonymous. Um, so that's sort of my frame in, in terms of how I'm going to approach the conversation. And I felt like a huge challenge for African feminists, for LGBTQI activists today is erasure. Um, in the previous session, somebody said, you know, one of the myths that exist on the continent that is predominant in my own country, Ghana, is homosexuality is an African. Even though we have expressions like, you know, Kofi Besia, you know, which hint at gender not being rigidly defined, right? People still today like to pretend that they're just men, they're just women, you know, our sexuality is fixed as in boxes. You're a straight woman today, you're a straight woman forever until you die. You can never change how you are. You just have to be one thing. And for me, erasure is a huge problem, right? Um, two friends of mine, Valerie Ba and fellow Jean Anumo, wrote um, an article recently which was published on Open Democracy 5050, if some of you want to read the full pieces. And this quote resonated with me and I felt it was relevant to this panel. Um, you can read it for yourself, but since I'm here, let me read it for you as well. One of the functions of patriarchy is to erase women and gender non-conforming people from historical records. In light of this, creating and amplifying alternative archives, archives becomes a radical act of resistance. This is something that I really believe, um, and this is something that I do in my work as a blogger, as a writer, um, as a content producer, because I think actually in this world, telling our stories is radical. Telling our stories of how we live, of how we love, is radical. It points to the fact that we exist and that we have always existed. And when I think of what are the challenges facing us, um, <laughs> I think of primarily a big problem we have now is the rise and rise of religious fundamentalisms. Um, Ghana is regarded as one of the most religious countries in the world. I think it's largely a fundamentalist country. Christian fundamentalism is a huge problem. Um, the church is in cahoots for the state. We're supposed to be a secular country but the church holds so much power that really we are not a secular country. Um, this is a, an image done by an artist called Prince Odro, which is, which is actually part of an exhibition that's going on in Ghana at the moment. And the man in the middle right now refers to himself as Angel Obinim, Obinim is his name. He used to be a bishop. And I say bishop in quotes because with some of these religious leaders, we don't really know how they came to their position. It's like, you know, it's not like appointed by a particular body, it's somehow a title that they get. And this is a man who has been accused of all sorts of things, of rape, of molestation. There are videos of him in his church stamping on the bellies of pregnant women, you know. Um, but these people have a lot of power. They are the ones who try and control what people do. They're the ones who try and say that homosexuality is wrong. Um, and they're powerful, you know? And I feel like a huge problem for us is how religious fundamentalism is in cahoots with patriarchy, is in cahoots with 
the social system that says men are superior to women. And for me, one of the things that actually is hopeful is looking at how artists, right, through their art, through their work, are, in a sense, taking back that space and showing the hypocrisy in the system, because I think that's a really powerful thing that art and creativity can do. Um, the organization I work for, the Association for Women's Rights and Development, recently with our partners, um, the Observatory of the University of Rights, has been doing a lot of work and research around how increasingly our human rights are at risk. And what are they at risk from? They are at risk from an alliance of far-right actors, which include religious civil society organizations, which include um, particular states, particular countries, right? And this alliance is working at the level of um, at the international spaces and various UN spaces to push back on the idea that human rights are universal, right? So they're training delegates to be able to work in UN spaces to prevent um, particular states from signing up to universal resolutions. They are coming up with their own ideas around who human, human rights what human rights is, they are co-opting the language of activism, right? And using it to push their own very conservative views, right? Um, they are working with youths, they're using social media, they're very savvy with their digital tools, they're really savvy with their communications, and a huge focus for them is sexuality. This is where their concern is. This is really what gets them going. Um, yeah, so if, if, if folks are interested, you know, I would encourage you to look at this report it's called Rights at Risk, as published by, by the Association for Women Rights and, and Development. And so the question I ask myself is, if this is a situation we're dealing with, what do we need to do? How do we resist? How do we get free? And for me, the very fact that we exist, the very fact that we continue to gather, the very fact that we talk about how can we build solidarity across our various movements, across our various locations, as an act of resistance, right? There's a future we are looking to, but then we also need to recognize how, in a sense, the fact that we still survive and that we still are and we're still creating is radical and is part of our resistance. So for me, it's a continuous journey. And for me, creating content and documentation and telling our own stories is really key to that. And this is part of why I do the work that I do around adventures. So Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women is a blog that I started with my friend Malaika in January 2009. And it's a space where African women from various parts of the continent and the diaspora, whatever their sexuality is, however they self-identify as a woman, are encouraged to share their own stories around sex and sexuality. And most of these stories are told from personal points of view, because as far as I'm concerned, if you are telling your own story, nobody can claim you don't exist, nobody can claim it's not true, because it's your story. Um, and later on, I'm in a panel where I'm speaking a bit more about adventures, so I don't want to go into too much detail at this point in time, but I wanted to just point out a conversation that we're currently having with um, a collective called Hola Africa, um, where we're encouraging people to think of what our future Africa sex will be like, what would be our ideal where future Africa sex is concerned, right? We did a poll and the question was, in 2030, our future African sex will be sexual liberation and freedom for all. How many people think that's what will happen? This is what we hope. Um, at least in terms of the figures of the poll, obviously it's a small poll on Twitter, it doesn't really say much, it's not like scientific or anything. 77% 77 people agreed with the idea that by 2030 there will be sexual liberation and freedom for all. But then what I like about the conversation is that it's also getting people to talk about what do we need to do now to get to that state where we are all free, right? And I wanted to shout out Hola Africa and their please her safe sex and pleasure manual because for me again it's an example of our documentation and again telling our stories. How can we say homosexuality 
does not exist. There's only one type of sexuality when people produce manuals, when people are sharing tips with each other around sexuality, when people are in a space where we have we do not have access to comprehensive sex education, where we do not have access to health, because people cannot be honest with their gynecologists, because people cannot speak to their doctors, because people are being stigmatized. You know, for me, producing a manual way of giving people sexual health lessons and tips is radical. It's an act of resistance, and it's important, and it's documentation that, again, says we are here. And so for me, what needs to change is actually the world. <laughs> You know, um, it's, it's the world that tries to say, this is the norm and everything else that's not in the straight box, you know, is wrong. Um, but part of what I feel generally is I feel hopeful, I feel optimistic because of the conversations I've been part of um, since 2009, a lot in online spaces, but also in offline spaces. Um, it's the conversations I have in feminist activist spaces, like the African Feminist Forum, where we'll always have a session where we're talking about sexuality. Um, it's, it's in my own life, you know, and in the life of the communities I'm part of. And so I asked them, just two activist friends, to share some of their hopes where Asexual rights is concerned, and I just want to read out what um, Kaguru Mugo, who's one of the curators of Hola Africa, said. She said, My hope is to see people being able to verbalize what it is they want, what it is they are, and what it is they understand about their sex and sexual identity, no matter if you're queer and KP or married and missionary. Not only this, but my hope is that they can have the space to express and discuss it at length and without shame. And the second quote from Sandy Suede Lamani, who is a filmmaker and activist, she said, my hopes for sex and the future of Africa are that we reach a point in our continent where sexual orientation and gender identity are no longer a cause of discrimination and that it is only the individual who has an opinion or say about their bodies. And I just thought I'll just leave all of you with a question for you to reflect on and maybe in the networking space some of you can come up and we can chat about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Nana. Um, 